without further delay, I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists. Sitting here right to my left is Shane McCleary. Shane is Senior Account Executive with Rogers TV Sales. Shane is also a York University alumna uh, from history. So welcome, Shane. Next is, next, is Shanae, uh, Shanae, sorry, next is Shane is Danae Peart. Did I say that right? Danae? Great, thanks. And Danae is Operations Coordinator Station Manager with CHRY Community Radio 105.5 FM, our uh, university radio station. And Danae is also a uh, York University alumna. She graduated from BA Communications and Linguistics and uh, with a BA in Urban Studies as well. Welcome, Danae. Next to Danae is Philip Perkins. Philip is a reporter with CHCH TV. He's also a York University alumnus. He graduated uh, from kinesiology and health science just recently. So welcome, Philip. Next to Philip, we have Mark Terry. Mark Terry is communications coordinator with the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies here at York University. And Mark is also a York University alumnus. He graduated with a BA in English and Media Studies. So welcome, Mark. Thank you for being here. Next to Mark is Sunny. Sunny is a documentary filmmaker with Aisha Productions. And she's also a York University alumna, and she graduated um, with an MA in history. And finally, and uh, we have Veronica. Veronica Thack, did I say that correct? Thatch? To catch, like to catch a bus. Oh, okay. <laughs> to catch. <laughs> Veronica is a writer and researcher for the show Live Here by This uh, on HGTV. And, uh, Veronica also attended York, York, York University. So welcome, Veronica. Thank you for being here. And thank you again to all of our panelists. So I'd like to begin this discussion today by asking each panelist to take just a few minutes to tell us about your current role and the organization that you're with. Shane, do you want to start? Sure. I work for Rogers TV Sales, so that means I work for City TV, Omni TV, Sportsnet, G4, Bio, which are all our specialty TV stations. I work on accounts that are local, such as Walking on a Cloud, all the way up to quasi-national ones, such as Mr. Sub. I do media plans and buys for uh, these clients that would be buying here in Toronto, the TV advertising, if not all across the market of you know the City TV Corporation, which is now almost uh, all of Canada. And my media buys are anywhere from a thousand to four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars a year. So I work with a variety of clients. Um, uh, multi-platforms involving radio, TV, and publishing, and that's kind of just my day-to-day -day job. Great. Thank you, Shane. Danae? So I'm Danae Parrott. I am currently the operations coordinator slash station manager at CHRY Community Radio, Inc. We're, in the, we're on the fourth floor of the student center here at York. Uh, my job is to handle the day-to-day -day operations of the station which involves anything from budgeting to human resource management. I'm also lucky to be able to still participate in what was my initial dream, which was broadcasting. So I still can be heard on air. I still host shows sometimes. I'm also engaged in training and mentorship in different areas. Um, at the station, we are um, in one of our growth phases again. So my job description has become a little bit more expansive. So I can speak to you about anything from change management to policy making and so on and so forth. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Hi there, I'm Phil. Uh, I'm a reporter at CHCH News for Morning Live, our morning show. Basically what I do is I check the scanners. I listen for bad things to happen and sometimes good things, sometimes good things. <laughs> And uh, they call me a videographer. So basically, I, I go to a scene. I take viz or clips with police officers, witnesses, um, and then come back, edit, and go back to the site and report live for the morning show from 6 in the morning till 9.30 in the morning. But my day starts at 10.50 the night before. That's when I wake up. And I get to work at 1.30 and a lot of prep there. Um, as I said, I'm a York alumni. I went to York here. Uh, for kinesiology health science and I also did the athletic therapy certificate program so I really thought I was going to be in science I wrote my MCAT did all that wanted to be a doctor and then something turned on or turned off uh, and then I actually went to the career counseling here and they we went through a couple questionnaires and I realized I didn't want to be a doctor anymore <laughs> after so many years of trying to study to become one and then I went to college for broadcasting and that is where I am now 
and I've been there since July. Great, thank you. Oh, okay. hey, it did things. It did a lot. It, did, it brought a lot of things to light, my values. And so, yeah, it helped. Thank you. Mark? That's a major career switch. Good it was you. big. Try telling it to my mom. It was, <laughs> it was rough. It was rough. Um, I work in uh, communications here at York. And um, a lot of the work I do comes from my, uh, my history as a filmmaker. I've been um, an independent producer for about 25 years, which is probably more time than you've been on the planet, most of the people here. Right? <laughs> so um, I do a lot of video work here at York, uh, interviewing the professors and bringing that to the website so you can get a glimpse of um, your teachers. Thank you. Funny? Good afternoon. Um, I'm, I wear two hats. I'm an independent documentary filmmaker and journalist. I've been working in films and journalism for about 20 years, 15 to 20 years. Um, so I get to travel a lot. I make films for documentaries for CBC, TVO, uh, national and international broadcasters. The other hat I wear, I run a documentary film institute in the summer months at the Seneca at York, right here on campus. So that's essentially what I do. Great, thank you, Sunny. Uh, so I, I work at a place called JV Productions. Um, I went to York first, and then I, I studied the acting program, and I didn't make it into second year. So then I went to Ryerson and studied radio and television. Um, and from there, I did a series of volunteer positions and interning, and finally someone hired me, and I worked on, on a bunch of reality shows, like Top Chef Canada, Battle of the Blades. I worked on a hidden camera prank show with Howie Mandel. <laughs> um, so I have a bunch of random hands. <laughs> yeah, he did not shake any. <laughs> um, yeah, so now I work on Live Here By This, which is about fantasy homes around the world. I'm a writer on the show. And then I also find the homes. So I literally type into Google, real estate, Italy. And then I just make cold calls and ask people if they speak English and see if we can get access into their homes. It's kind of bizarre, um, <laughs> but never boring. <laughs> Great, thank you. Can't wait to hear more about all of your stories. So I'd like you to think back um, uh, to when you were in university here at York or at Ryerson and um, share a little bit with us about what got you interested in this field, um, you know, and how you ended up from, you know, where you are now from when you graduated. So what are kind of the steps throughout your career that landed you where you are now? So maybe we'll start the other way. Veronica, do you mind starting? Oh, okay. Um, well, when I first graduated from Ryerson, I thought all I wanted to do was kids TV. So then I interned at um, Kids CBC, and I learned a lot there. Um, and then while I was doing that, I auditioned for a game show, and I was and I was cast. And I wa as I was leaving, the casting director said, "I'll cast you again." And I was like, "Amazing! I'll totally be on your sh on the show with you again." And then I said, "In passing, or you could give me a job." And I didn't think it would work, but it did. She hired me to be her assistant. Uh, I was her casting assistant for a show called The John Doerr Television Show on the Comedy Network. It's a little bit off color, um, but she taught me everything she knew about casting and I kind of fell in love with it. So, um, And then from there, it's just a matter of finding contracts that are being in the right place at the right time and working my butt off <laughs> and you know putting in the hours and, and kind of being nice to everyone that I meet because you never really know who is important and who's not. <laughs> I was the audience coordinator for Battle of the Blades and we would always say everyone's a VIP, like treat everyone like a VIP because you never know if you're sitting, you know, if you're seating the head of a network, if you're seating, you know, Shailen Bourne's mom or whoever it is. So that was kind of our philosophy and I've kind of applied that to the rest of my career. Everyone's a VIP. <laughs> nice. nice philosophy. And can you tell us a little bit about that first internship that you got? Was it paid, unpaid, and how did you find it? Um, it was unpaid. It was an unpaid internship at CBC, but I got credit towards my degree at Ryerson. Um, and it was cool because the CBC is an awesome place to be. Um, there's a lot happening there, and I kind of um, went around to all the different, like I helped make props, and then I helped answer a viewer, because um, like little kids would send recipes to Mama Yama, who's a puppet. <laughs> and the puppets Yama. can't answer the mail, so I did. Um, so you know that was kind of cool. The viewer relations part was really neat, um, and seeing how you know seeing that how a network gets so many pitches from all around. Canada and the world and you know getting to see the heads of the network kind of make decisions and and that was it was amazing I loved it great thank you Sunny 
Yeah. You want me to go back how far? <laughs> um, I'm from the prairies. I'm from Saskatchewan. I went into journalism. Uh, and after I finished my BA in journalism, I got an internship, summer internship with the Globe and Mail. So I moved to Toronto. And from there, I, long story short, I worked in television for CBC Radio, CBC TV, uh, Kitchen and Waterloo Records, the Globe and Mail, freelance for various magazines and newspapers. And uh, it became very apparent that I had a hard time keeping a job. Uh, <laughs> I would start and then I would get, I don't know if it was attention thing or I have trouble following orders or working for people. Um, I leave. And so I've done a lot of freelance work <coughs> for newspapers and also for radio. And then a few years later, I stumbled upon this art called the documentary filmmaking. And I can tell you when I was in journalism, it wasn't something that we really studied. Uh, it was before Michael Moore time, before you know um, uh, the guy who did that. Where is a Big Mac? Uh, uh, no, super yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> so documentary was still kind of this unknown, unpopular uh, art out there. And and I, when I discovered it, I thought, this is it. This is what I think I want to do. So it's almost like documentary. The career that I ended up going into found me rather than me pursuing it. So all this to say, you never know how you're going to end up from A to Z. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so just keep your options open. Okay, thank you. Mark? Yeah, it's pretty much the same story for me. Um, I was an English grad at York. I studied English and basically literature and really nothing to do with film or television at all. Uh, but I did take a, a minor in, in what they called media studies at the time. And that brought me here to the campus where there was a really nice television studio. I'm not even sure if it's still here. But they had all this very old equipment, something called a pedestal camera. Uh, that's what's on the floor, and you know what I'm talking about. And it has little wheels on it, move it around. Um, that technology doesn't exist anymore. But um, when I was exposed to that, I thought that's, this was really cool. And I would like to do something like that. But when I graduated, <coughs> I didn't figure I had enough experience to actually get a job doing that. So I steered towards journalism. Uh, much like Sunny, I ended up uh, working at the Toronto Sun in my last year at York. And I had a full-time job while I attended classes full-time. But you can do that when you're young, right? You don't want yeah. yeah. Now I would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, from there I went to the Toronto Star. And then from there I published my own magazine called Hollywood Canada. It was a controlled circulation publication and it was national. And um, on the streets of Toronto, our greatest competition was Now Magazine. And there wasn't many uh, publications like that at the time. But that kind of opened the door to the um, film and television world for me because I was interviewing these people. And one day I had the opportunity to, um, to videotape Clive Barker. I don't know if you know that name. Does anybody know? Yeah, I know you know. <laughs> uh, he's a, a horror novelist from Liverpool in England. Um, you might know the movie Hellraiser that guy with the little puzzle box and the pins in his head, right? That's Clyde Barker, he created that character. So he was um, here on a, on a book tour and uh, I brought the video camera out and did a little uh, interview with him. And then he offered um, his films for me to use as clips uh, in telling the story. So that ended up becoming a documentary. It was just a short, just 23 minutes, but it was long enough to be a television half hour with seven minutes of commercial time for the broadcaster. <laughs> and, um, and the real surprise was I entered that in a film festival in Vancouver where a couple of Hollywood studio um, scouts were sitting in the audience, saw the film, loved it, and um, made me an offer. Wow. They flew me down to Hollywood and I met with them in the boardroom and they offered me what I thought was an ungodly huge amount of money for this tiny little film, which probably cost me $3,000 to make at the time. And, um, and so I said yes. And, um, and then they released it uh, theatrically in the States. So that's not going to happen to anybody here, I promise you. <laughs> but that's kind of how I got involved with that. And um, I continued to make documentary films and, uh, and some um, feature films as well, in the drama department, for the next 25 years. And then 
we're here today. And what brought you to York? Uh, the desperate need for regular income. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to come back to York in some capacity, and uh, the communications uh, job, as it was described, seemed to incorporate all the, all the skills I developed over the years, so it was a natural fit. All right. Well, I'll preface everything I say by first saying there's no set path to get wherever you want to go. Um, and also the second one, you need to love, you need to really, really love what you want to become, whether it's a director, producer, assignment editor, reporter, anchor, whatever. Because uh, when, I, when I was at York in first year, I was playing football, not impressive. And I know. And my coach asked me while I walked into practice, Phil, do you, do you really want to be a doctor? And I said, yeah, I want to be an orthopedic surgeon. That's what I want to be. And then he asked me, well, let me ask you a question. Would you do it for free? And I said, no. The big allure with being a doctor is the status, Dr. Phil, Dr. Perkins, and the cash, the consistent cash. And, and he said, what would you do for free? And I said, well, I want to be a sportscaster forever. I'll do that for free. I don't even care. And I'll do it anywhere. He said, well, that's what you should become. And I was... I didn't listen to him. Four years later, I wrote my MCAT and got my score back. And I was like, I don't really want to write this again to do, a, do better because uh, I don't think I want to be this. It's after going to the career counselor. And um, I literally weighed my options. I talked about that. I, would, I wanted to be a doctor for the, the wrong reasons. I wanted to make a lot of money consistently. And I wanted to be a sportscaster because I loved it. It would make me happy and I'll do it for free. And Coincidentally, there was a show on the score called Drafted, and it's basically kind of search for their next sportscaster. And I auditioned the first time, didn't get it. My audition was so bad, they put it on the first episode on, on flops. And then, <laughs> yeah, and I actually had time to do it too, and it was bad. And then I was well, not that discouraged. I worked as a personal trainer. I used my kin degree and my athletic therapy background to train people. And... Um, the drafted season two came out. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna wing it. I'm just gonna go to the Eaton Center and just try out. And I did it. Then a week later, they said, you made the top 10. And I was like, okay. I had no training. And uh, I showed up, I made top seven. And I got a lot of good feedback from the pros there, like Cavi was there and Sid Sixero and all those guys, if you guys watch sports, they gave me a lot of good feedback. And these are all guys who I idolized and um, it made me feel like I made the right decision. The people in, one, in the three big sports channels in Canada said that I had the chops. So then I went to college after that, that specified in sports broadcasting, and uh, did that for two years, and I was a waiter at the same time. So like you said, we're young, we can, you can do crazy things like that, like get four hours of sleep, go to school, and wait tables, and um, did that. And the biggest thing for me, talk about internships, Part of our curriculum was getting an internship after the two years. I, I said, screw it, I'm gonna do it during my first year. So while everyone else is getting internships, I'm gonna go get a job. And so TSN Radio just launched, and I told them I'll work for free, I don't even care. And they said, fine, after a week. And I worked on uh, a radio show in the summertime from 11 a.m. until 7 p.m. for free. And I was so poor by the end of that summer, I, I don't even know how much money I made. And this school was, Seventeen and a half thousand dollars a year, and uh, so I could have gone to Osgood uh, for that, <laughs> and uh, so I did that. And then, but lo and behold, I I worked hard, I networked, I busted my butt in my last year, made a demo, well, and made it ahead of everyone else, and just started mailing it out to people, just mailing it out, and going to the station and talking to people. And CHCH was the one channel that called called me back, and. That was it. So while everyone else was getting internships, I was working. And so that's, that's how I got in, in Cole's notes version. That's about it. So that's an example. There is no set path. You, you make it, Joan. I was going to be a doctor, and I flipped it in two years. So if everyone here is a communications major, great. But if you're a Korean language major, you can still do it. So, yeah. Just got to put in your time. Mm -hmm. you went in. Did you just walk in? Did you have an appointment? Was there um, an audition scheduled? Or well, for, for Drafted, there was an audition schedule, but then um, for TSN Radio, we luckily, it was a sports casting school, and the, the big part of it was they want to get you a job. So they brought the news director in to talk about his life and his career path, and uh, no one else was asking for his email, and I did, 
And so I emailed them and told them that I, I want to intern there. I just want to watch, just from observation, learn how they do things. And then uh, nothing came up. And then a week or two weeks later, uh, they said, you know what, I think we're going to need some help. And then they asked, what hours can I make? And I said, any time. And so they just told me daytime. And that was it. So, yeah. Or best thing you can do, it's on their website. Mm -hmm. And normally, guys' emails are first name dot last name at bellmedia.ca. And that's, that's all you do. And you just send your resume and your cover letter and your demo and all that. And tell them you'll work for free. They love hearing that. <laughs> work free. <laughs> work free. <laughs> And that's where I come in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, pardon me, I started getting a cold on Sunday. Um, for me, I always wanted to be in broadcasting. I think as soon as I discovered speaking, I thought I should speak with a microphone. Um, the thing is, I didn't know how to do that. Um, so, I'm an international student. I started out as an international student. I'm now a Canadian citizen. But as an international student, I heard about universities abroad and I decided to try out, see if I could get in. I applied to Rice and I applied to York. I got into both. I picked York. Um, so I got to York, I'm doing communications and linguistics. And it's important to decide, as, as you were pointing out, there is no set path because I could have gone down the speech pathology path because that started to intrigue me. Um, and you know if you're a communications major at York, uh, there's seldom any internships attached to you studying at York. So um, my thing was I happened to find CHRY one day. I was walking with some friends. We were in the student center building and a friend of mine said, you know there's a radio station at York? I'm like, there is? And they said, yeah, and it's in this building. So we decided during our lunchtime to find it. And we found it. And the rest with me and CHOY's kind of history. I did a lot of volunteering. I've um, in total been at CHOY for about 10 years now. Uh, and I started as a volunteer. And now we've changed structures, now we're doing internships. So we have quite a few Seneca students who are doing um, credited internships with us. Uh, so it's opportunity, meeting, preparation, meeting, are you flexible? Um, for me, I was, I was flexible with the dream. I was like, I want to be a broadcaster, but hey, if something else interesting comes along, or something linked, I'll take it. Does it involve a microphone? I'll make it happen. So it's those kind of journeys. Um, unfortunately, I didn't go to career services. You guys seem to be pretty cool. I should have <laughs> talked to you. <laughs> but, um, but now, the role I'm doing now is, isn't even broadcasting, but I'm in media. So it's that kind of interesting pathway, right? Um, once you're still enjoying it as you do it, that's important. Great, thank you. Shane? My story gels with almost everybody's here. It's my career has been anything but planned. I initially, we all had these fantasies of what we wanted to be when we were young, and I wanted to be a journalist. I had this fantasy of going around the world and asking people a question, you know, tell me about yourself. Got accepted into journalism school, panicked. Didn't want to move from Saskatoon to Calgary, so I thought, we'll stay in university here, do something secure. Fell in love with art history, and I became, you know, this compulsive maniac. I couldn't get a BA, I had to get a BA, I had to get an MA, then I had to get another MA, and then I had to, you know, finish my PhD. And, you know, the story got better as time went on. I did my first degree in Saskatoon, I came to Toronto, discovered the art world, but I came to York. And then I, st I worked a year between my MA and my PhD, and I worked for a woman, Diane Stadnicki, who's here right now. And you just need one or two people in your life to find out something about you that you don't know about yourself and someone to help you. You've got to cast your net far and wide. And Diane taught me the whole kind of career thing. You know, Shane, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, push me, nudge me. And still to this day, Shane, you've got to come here. You never know who you're going to meet. <laughs> um, so it's a story like that, but then also too, I did my success here at York and, you know, with Diane saying, do this, do this, do that, 
I ended up at Dartmouth, I ended up at Johns Hopkins, I ended up at you know, the finest American schools on scholarship. And the opportunity there was fantastic. And academia really, I get misty eyed about it, but it really was my career. Like that, that I, I was going to be the academic living in Paris writing you know, art reviews from my um, apartment. It didn't turn out that way. I left academia and I was going to get a job in the real world. Well, because of my credentials in the States, I right away got a job at Western to teach art history. And teaching art history was like coffee talk. I couldn't believe they actually paid you to get up and talk about something that you were so passionate about. And I figured after, I wasn't going to fit in the art world, like, look at me, you know, I'm kind of too much fun, I'm into fashion, I had a background <laughs> as a model. I did fit in in academia in many ways also. A um, little bit of vanity was going to, so one thing led to another. I left academia and I thought I'm going to get a job in popular culture, even though I've been volunteering at the ROM and at the AGO, I didn't fit in with the blue hairs either. Um, <laughs> so I, I, you know, getting back to that thing of asking a question, that's how I got all, that's how I've gotten all my jobs and that's really has been my success because I can engage with people. I am curious as can be. You know, every university I've known the uh, the custodian. I've known the people shelving the books. I know at the grocery store the woman who packs my groceries and so forth. And it was through a series of questions after leaving academia, trying to find a job that led to a film, uh, a career in uh, commercial film production. And the only reason why I got the job was because, as the woman said, you got into my office. Nobody gets into my office. And I remember when I was being interviewed at CTV because, you know, you go in prepared. You were a student. You got the questions. I remember the guy just saying, give me the damn p uh, sheet of uh, questions. Let me just answer them right now. But because I had the academic training, because I probably had the passion and curiosity for, you know, people, these are what has gotten me the jobs. And being in sales, like I never thought I'd be in sales. Like who does sales? It's like you do sales if you can't find a job, right? I thought I'll get into CTV and I'll find out what I really want to be. Um, but you know what, it's been the best job in the world because guess what, I get to interview people every single day. I get to hear about their business. I get to, even though I'm working with money, I get to come up with creative media plans. I get to cut outside the box. And connecting the other passion to art history, I make a good living where I actually go to Europe every year to see the real art piece. You know, I'm, I'm, unfortunately the art world doesn't pay many of us very well. You know, my girlfriend works at Casa Loma four days a week. Does she get to see Guernica? Does she get to see Miro? Does she get to see, you know, these places that I get to go? So, life is really funny. You know, it's all what everyone said here. You cast your net far and wide and you build on what you have and maybe sometimes somebody has to help you tell you what your career is. Because I didn't wake up thinking, oh, yeah, TV sales, here I come. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's my story. Well, thank you all for sharing that. It's so interesting because at the Career Center, we always get students who think that what they do now right after graduation is really what they're going to be doing for the rest of their life. And what we try to tell them all the time is your career isn't linear. And you all are an example of that. And, you know, uh, being open to opportunity, taking chances, and finding ways to pursue your passion yet maybe within your um, career, day-to-day -day career, or in other ways, like finding a career to help support your passion, like with you, Shane. So it's really exciting. I always get excited when the panelists say everything that we want, you know, we want you to say, and it's, it's really, really um, an interesting story to hear all of you. So now, you know, again, thinking back to when you were in university, if you could take a minute to think about um, something you wish you had known then, that you know now as you began your career path. So I'll let you think about that for a minute and, and whoever wants to answer first can answer. Veronica, do you want to answer? Oh, sure. Um, I think that right out of graduation, I was like, this is it. I'm going to be so successful. I'm going to go out and be like the head of some important production company. And then, and I think a lot of people kind of have that attitude. They graduate and they're like, this is it. I'm like, but then the reality is you'll end up stacking chairs, cleaning up garbage. Um, getting coffee, like all those kind of menial jobs, you're like, oh, I'm too good for this. But that's not the case. Like those jobs are really important. And the people, like on set, like on a show like Top Chef Canada, there's catering that comes every day, and someone needs to, you know, put those chairs out and put those tables out and, and those little things. Um, you know, that's I, I don't know how to if I'm making sense, but basically, those jobs are really important. And if you 
Um, if someone notices, like, oh my God, she stayed extra. She put those chairs away. That's awesome. That's a person that I want to have on my team for the next show I work on. Um, so just kind of to have that, mm -hmm. you have to be humility, I guess, is the, is the lesson. And being willing to do some of those jobs that may not sound appealing because you don't know where it'll take you. Yeah, and do them really well. <laughs> <laughs> be nice to people. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Anyone else? Um, I, I wish I knew where the word networks came from and how to find them. Uh, when I was a student at New York, I did not know where they were. I heard people say, you got to have networks and you got to work those networks. And I'm like, but what if you're not in a network? <laughs> how do you find those networks and work them? So, you know, in hindsight, I wish somebody had fleshed that out for me. Um, now I know, kind of, <laughs> um, where these, you know, hidden networks are. Um, it, it turns out, if you're interested in something, you really have to be interested. You can't just say you're interested. You have to read about it. You have to explore it. You have to go where it is. So if it's TV, you go where TV is. Wherever it's being filmed, you go. You know, you, you have to explore that which you say you're interested in. Because... Um, as much as doors open for you in odd ways, they're not just going to open for you. So um, I, found, I found out later that there are you know, groups, there are unions, there are all these um, things that come with media that you know, I didn't know initially. So I didn't know about conferences. You should attend conferences. You never know who you meet there. Um, and you never know what you learn there. Even if you don't meet anybody who can give you an in anywhere, you might hear a nugget that mm. you know, turns on a light for you. And so for me, it's, um, yeah, that word network was elusive for me as an undergraduate, but it's less elusive if you're really interested in your field and you seek it out. Can you give us an example of some of those groups or? Um Oh, I, I'm not the person to talk to. I'm, I'm stuck in books these days. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, for me, uh, a typical example is an unrelated field that I've, I've been in. I've had the, the pleasure of interning and volunteering at different organizations. And they had conferences that they put on. Um, I used to be, when I, when I was doing my second degree, I did urban studies. So I used to work at the, the Urban Institute. They did breakfast meetings all the time. And what was my role as a volunteer? Setting up the tables, making sure the cloth went on the table just you know, at the right angle, and um, putting out the brochures. But at the breakfast, there were people from all walks of life. There were people who were there talking about the future of media, and all these interesting things that I was intrigued by. And because I was there, I was free at the breakfast. So I could listen in. And I could ask for business cards. Some people don't necessarily want to share that with you. But you note where they work. And you note what they do at that workplace. And then you go from there. You rip it from there. So if you hear you know, a, a situation like this, a career services is having a panel, you go because you never know who's going to be on that panel or what opportunities will present themselves. Um, for me, nothing is too small um, if you're interested in the field. Great, Great example. Thank you. Sunny, any I wish I knew then what I know now. Is that the question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that I didn't take university so seriously and that it wasn't so great focused. I know that you're all worried about getting the perfect grades, graduating, and hopefully a job at the end. But I like to think that, and that's why I went back to school, back to do my MA in history much, much later in my career, because at that time I was ready to go back to school and learn for the sake of learning. And I see so many students miss that wonderful golden opportunity to learn because they're so anxious about getting that job, whatever that job is, about getting that perfect grade. Because I can tell you that in my field, when I hire people, I don't ask for their university degrees. I don't care if they got an A or a D. What I look for is a person as a whole, their life experience, their integrity, 
their humility, all the personalities and qualities that you can learn. I mean, university is a time and space for you to learn and explore. Don't use the university just as kind of, I'm gonna get to A, B, C, and I will get that dream job. And if I don't, well, I just wasted my degree. It, it doesn't work that way. Okay, so I think that would be the best advice I can give to the people. Great, yeah. thank you. I really agree with Sunny on that. Like, it will turn out. It did turn out for me. And there's something about enjoy the moment, do the best you can at that moment, don't use the university to get you that job. You know, I remember when I was being interviewed in McLaren McCann, because this is my foray into popular culture. I'm in my little black outfit because I came from the art world. I had no money for parking. I don't even know how I parked. Um, and I went in with all my questions and everything, and the woman just said to me, you have no job, ex no, you have no practical job experience. And I'm like, but I have all these scholarships, I have all this, all of this. It didn't mean anything in the end. You know, so that's when all that work. But when I think back of it, university, I loved it. I loved the intellectual pursuit. And you know what? I'm glad I did it. Art history, did it give me a job at Rogers TV sales selling city TV and breakfast TV? Not at all. But boy, I can converse. I, and I have a different relationship. Many people in sales see sales as money, cha-ching, cha-ching. For me, it's still like getting the A grade, you know, making my budget. It's like the A grade. but. You gotta enjoy the moment, you gotta cast your net far and wide. You don't know where you're gonna end up. I don't know where I'm gonna end up tomorrow. There's still another chapter or two I'm hoping for me. Um, but you gotta be true to yourself too. And you know, like I like Philip's attitude too. You gotta laugh at it. Like the stories we could probably tell you of our pursuits and those other stories of the failures and disappointment. So, you know, seize the moment. It's going to work out. You don't need the ideal job when you're 24. It will work out, you know. Have some faith in yourself. You're not bad people, you know. We don't, like Sunny says, we don't live by the resume. Yeah. And not that, I mean, I think what you, you could point about a academia is that, you know, just because you have a degree doesn't mean you'll get the job, but certainly I would imagine that what you studied gave you a good foundation for all of those things that you, the skills that you- being need. a human being, yes. Yeah. But not in you know, the career of sales. Like, I'm the one they ask how to spell the words. <laughs> okay, how do you spell the words? Can you just look at this email? That's what, but it's, it's the integrity of me as a human being, you know? Um, and that's what it has made me feel good about. I'm, I'm proud of my university education. I did come from an educated family. I worked hard at it. But I enjoyed it. I love the friends I made and that whole intellectual pursuit thing. It was great, but it'll work out. Just, you know, chill. There's such a, everyone's so anxious about their careers. It all works out. Chill, we're gonna. <laughs> 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 Probably be never invited. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Probably never be invited back to another panel discussion. <laughs> <laughs> chill. I wish someone told me to chill. <laughs> I would. But they don't. You I didn't won't chill. Know. You won't. I used You're to go so to. Ambitious. I used to go to regional anatomy classes, record my professor, and listen to him on the way home, because he talked so quickly. And I wanted to get an A, A plus, because I thought yeah. that's what doctors want. That's what they need. Because yeah. med school is kind of like that, but not. It's kind of changing now. Um, they're looking up the whole person, but before it was like, what'd you get in biology? B plus, later. I'm like, okay, <laughs> what was your MCAT score? 30, bye, you know? Uh, how many hours of internship did you do at the hospital? 20, nope. Like, and so that's, that's what I was wound up tight. I think, yeah, there's one thing I wish I knew is chill out, have fun. I kind of, I played football for a year at York and things were looking good. I was playing with guys who are now, they just won a great cup last year. Um, but I wish I could just chill and not take myself so seriously and take what I didn't really want to do so seriously so I could actually play football four years. That was probably the toughest decision of my life because that was my identity before I got here. And so, yeah, I wish I knew where I was at this point so I could tell Phil in 2004, just relax. Like, study, but like, relax. Just, it's all going to be all right. But I also don't regret too much. I've learned, I learned how to study. I learned how to memorize stuff because that's what science is basically is a lot of memorization and in my job something like today I was at a at a charity uh, breakfast and then an hour later there's a 10 car pile up in Hamilton and I got to go and I got to learn everything about it on the way there and after that I had to talk about the Blackberry Z10 and learn everything about that and go to the launch there is all a matter from 6 a.m. to 930 
So that's where I, the things I don't regret is doing the science program and learning how to study and pull those crazy hours because that's my life right now. I work from 1.30 in the morning until 9.30 in the morning. I go to bed at 4 in the afternoon. And yeah, doing, doing, studying for your MCAT will do that to you. So you learn that. You learn how to have a little bit of discipline. But at the same time, I wish Phil Perkins could have calmed down a bit. Had some fun. But, but you yeah. would be where you are. Exactly. It's yeah. managing the beast inside you. Like, yeah. It's like that every day with me still. But mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. you know, age is really yeah. chilling. <laughs> Chill. Chill. Mm -hmm. Yes, chilling is good advice, <laughs> but I also know that there's many people in this room who cannot do that, who don't want to chill. They want to get out of university and get that first job right away. And you probably already discovered uh, the passion that you have for broadcast media, film and television, and you can't wait. You know, you want to create those opportunities for yourself immediately. And um, what I wish I knew uh, when I was in university, is that any kind of study or course that you take in film and television um, is missing something. And what it's missing is the overall view. Because you study how to be a cameraman, you can study how to be an editor, you can study how to be a director, how to act in front of the camera. These are all tiny little pieces of the industry. And what I wish they had uh, when I was there was an overall kind of view basically teaching a course um, on producing because what happened throughout my career was all roads were pointing to the Rome known as producing um, because it's very very difficult to walk into any broadcast organization and say I want to be a director I want to direct your next show or I want to be a cameraman um, it's just harder to do that but if you control your own destiny by producing your own projects then you become an independent producer. And then you can write, you can shoot, you can edit, you can do all those things. You can hire yourself. Um, but the main difference is you're ultimately responsible. You are your own boss. Okay, you're not working for anybody, you're working for yourself. And your client, your clients are the people that you would go to for a job. So it's the CBC, it's CTV, um, Warner Brothers. Uh, these are the people that um, will buy your project and you have to pitch to them in advance to get a broadcast license agreement and a fee out of them and that money is used to make your project. Now don't mortgage your house to make your first movie. Yeah. No, in fact never do that, not even your second movie. Um, the temptation is there and you will be tempted to do that because you're so close you only need another 25000 you know, and you can easily slap some paper on your house and complete that and then start your project. Because you know and you believe that once it's done, it's going to sell through the roof and you're going to make a fortune. Not necessarily true. Right, Sonia? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but the good thing is when you do control your own project, um, the entire world is your marketplace. Uh, whatever you sell in Canada, you can sell in every other country in the world. And it's not just territorial, it's also different media. Um, there's television, there's theatrical, there's educational, there's IPTV, <coughs> that's internet. Is that what you call it now? <laughs> hey? Is that what you guys call it? IPTV? And, um, and home video, there's all kinds of different um, media that you can sell to each territory as well. And so that's what I wish I knew back then, rather than just one little component of the industry, that there was kind of an overall um, look at the industry as a whole. Thank you. Yeah. I have one last question before we start taking questions from the audience. And Danae touched on this a little bit about networking, because that is a, you know, a buzzword these days, network, network. Can you um, share some experience that you had with networking and, and what role networking played in your career and, ex and a specific example of how it played out in your career? Yeah, I was always really afraid of the word networking because I think it sounds like something sleazy. It sounds like you have a card and you're like, yeah, here's my card. Yeah. I don't know, to me that just seems like I don't want to do that. I don't want to approach strangers and tell them how great I am and they should hire me. Um, but I think that if you think of it as just talking to people, if you just talk to someone and have like a real conversation, that's a more, uh, I like thinking of it that way. Yeah, it's a good point. Like relationship building. Mm -hmm. 
I'm the worst networker. You ever <laughs> I, like, the ironic thing is this business, you do have to network, you have to make cold calls, you have to walk up to strangers and start selling or start pitching or start at least tell them something about yourself, what makes you so special from everybody else. But many people in this business are introverts. We are the creative types, we are more of the artistic types. Yes, we have to do the business and we have to go out and earn money, but at the end of the day, we spend a lot of time just talking to ourselves, living inside our heads. So for me to approach a person, let alone a room full of people, it kills me every time. And, and I'd rather avoid it if I can. But then within that, you find your own way. Right, you start with that one person, a friend or a colleague, and then. So what I do is I, you know, kind of rely on my husband, who's a little bit more of a sociable <laughs> person, or I actually hire a production manager or an associate producer and say, here, can you go out to all these coffee and parties and stuff and <laughs> see? Sunny, yeah. I'll go for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come and talk to me after. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. I could call for you. Yeah. <laughs> There's a good example of networking right there. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a network. I, the whole thing of organizations, all that stuff, I'm just not that person. I'm more one-on-one. -on -one. And what I had were mentors. I was lucky I had Diane. I was lucky I had some, uh, two other people that were mentors. And they were industry-specific, and others just were like personal-specific. So that, for me, works for me. It may not work for you. And that's the that whole thing, too, about a career, too, is finding what works for you. We all get there in a different way. Um, but I'm just more of a one-on-one -on -one kind of person. I think the best kind of networking that can be done when you're starting in this industry is to join uh, memberships and organizations related to the industry. Um, like Veronica mm -hmm. said, you know, like networking when you're at a film festival party is, is kind of not cool. You know, it's going up to establish people saying, you know, hire me, give me, give me, give me. Uh, but when you're with an organization like the Academy of Canadian Cinema and Television, for example, uh, that's a very good organization to be part of because they have um, these breakfast meetings in the morning where um, professionals will come and talk about what they're doing and give you kind of tips on, on what you should be doing in the industry because it changes all the time. Eh? And you need to be kept up to date on what's going on. And, um, and at these things, you can talk to somebody as peers, not as somebody begging for a job but as someone who's already within the industry. And, and they'll just say, well, I'm working on a project now and, and I'm really having a tough time finding a production manager or a director. And is that what you do? Well, maybe we should talk. Send me your resume. And mm -hmm. see, it's much more organic that way. And especially when you're starting out too, um, you need to have the credibility of memberships to these organizations because you don't have the, um, the cred yet in terms of your own projects. And, uh, and credit lists, right? Your IMDb posting is only this big, you know, a couple of student films, right? So it's very good to be part of those organizations because they help you not just uh, professionally but personally too. Yeah, I find that being affiliated with a group helps. Like that, I'm part of a like National Sportscasters and Sports Writers Association yeah. of America, and I did that because my ultimate goal is to be in the states because sure. they take sports like religion, and. Um, that's one side, and I went to as far as going to North Carolina for the awards weekend, just networking, and it was a little bit of that, like a lot of, can you please hire me, sir, and give me a visa, which is tough. Um, but I got to meet a lot of people my age who are just graduated from their program and seeing what kind of struggles they're going through, and you network with them, and you see how they're getting jobs and what they've learned that you haven't, um, because they, like I said, they take things differently down there. And, and then you meet the guys at the top of their game, like Bob Costas, who I died when I met. And just hearing their story and realizing you're never going to get to where he is because he's Bob Costas and you're who you are. Uh, but hearing from them definitely changes a lot. But then at the same time, I think you, said, you talk about organic. And if, you, if you're interning somewhere, that's almost like networking as well. Instead of talking to your boss, like, hey, can, can you guys pay me at some point? You don't have to say that. They see you working eight hours a day for free, getting coffee. Uh, transcribing an interview that was 10 minutes long, it'll take you an hour and a half to do. So that is you telling them, I want a job without saying anything. And they will tell you, it's like, hey, I'm kind of hearing, you know, over at an agent court, they're looking for a story editor. I know you want to be on air, but you might want to do it. And you can use them as a reference or something. 
So it's not always, please give me a job. It's, you don't have to say it, you, you show it. And that's what helped with me, and also on a grander scale, being affiliated with something and meeting a whole bunch of big wigs. So those are two different sides that I found. Um, as someone who hires, I, I can attest to your last mm -hmm. few comments. Um, the individuals in our space, we've managed to hire some of them because they were volunteers and because we were able to observe their body of work and their output. And so when they applied for the position, they may have been green in terms of how well their resume read, but because they showed those things to us, we were able to give them a try and we were able to say, okay, what would be the learning curve for this person as opposed to another person? Um, because this person knows our space, this person has already done some of the job already for free. So. He is correct. We will look at those things. Um, another interesting thing, because I keep learning about this networking thing, it's half elusive to me still. Um, another interesting thing that happened just recently, one of our work studies, a York student who's a work study with us, uh, she was sticking around late, those things help. Um, she was sticking around late and I work late every day. And um, one of our shows was on. He happens to play um, old school type Motown and old school reggae ska. And I was talking to him after his show, and we're just exchanging information, you know, music heads just talking about music. And she's in the office looking at us, having this conversation, and she really wants to be a part of it. And he walks out of the room for a bit, and she's like, he sounds cool. I'm like, let me introduce you. So I introduced her to him, and I said, this is one of the coolest guys we have on air. I don't know how you don't know him. And I talked him up and so on. They had a conversation, and he's like, I gotta run now because I'm working on a shoot. And she's like, a shoot? Where, what? And just those few questions, she's now interning at his company. Mm -hmm. Because he said, you know what? We have an internship coming up. We're interested in this kind of thing and she's in communications. And I, try it out. <laughs> and she tried it out. So I saw networking work for somebody. It may not have worked for me, but I've become, sorry I'm eating candy because my throat hurts, um, but I've become very curious about just conversations with people and I've become kind of a connector for people just because of my years now with working with other people. Um, so it's, it comes, it will come. The elusive network will develop, but it's being available and allowing yourself to know that you won't always make the big bucks on your first job. Please know that. Please know that. Like, if you're if you do great, let me know. I can hang out with you. Give you can pay for dinner. <laughs> you can pay for my my dinner. I'll take that. But if you can't, know that all of us had those stages where you're doing some stuff for free, you're doing some part payment internships, or you're doing some. You only get reimbursed if you did a special project type thing. It it will come though, and it will build from there. Yeah. And that's a great example that you give because. <coughs> That goes to what Veronica was saying, what Mark is saying, is that, you know, networking isn't always about what can you do for me, you know, hire me. It's really about just having a conversation about something you're interested in, connecting with that person, and then, you know, maybe it'll go somewhere immediately. In that case, that was great, and maybe it won't, but that's someone you've connected with in some way or other, right? And as students now, I mean, um, you know, here at the university, there's so many opportunities for you to connect with people. And through the Career Center, for example, we have um, panels like this. I think you're taking a, a, right, a step in the right direction by coming to panels like this. But we also have a program, for example, TASTE. How many of you have heard of TASTE? Okay, so TASTE is Take a Student to Eat, where uh, we connect two current students with a York University alumnus who's maybe working in the field of interest for you. And you can go out for coffee or for lunch and do an informational interview, which is basically similar to this, trying to find out about their career, how did they break into it, a little bit more about the field. And we, we help to make those connections for you. So if you're interested in about that program or any other programs, you can come see me afterward. But at the university, there are, through um, you know your colleges, there are programs as well for you to connect your student organizations. So. Um, you have programs here to make those connections, at least in the beginning. So now, I have so many more questions, but I'll give you both an opportunity to ask questions. Um, so what we'll do is, if you have a question, just if you don't mind coming to the mic right there, because the questions 
Um, it makes it easier for everyone to hear and also for the video camera. Um, that would be great. And if you could try to keep your questions to something a little bit more general, not like specifically about you, you know, I got an A and what can I do? Will you hire but me? something that would yeah. be appropriate for everyone to hear, that would be great. Hi. So my question is, how essential do you think um, a university degree is <laughs> in comparison to, say, a college degree where you get like practical experience? Okay. So the question is, do you need me to repeat it for the video? So the question is, how uh, essential is a university deg degree versus a college degree, right? Uh, for this field, right? Yeah. It's University degree is very important. It is. It is. <laughs> it is. I think, yeah, I think it's mainly because, not because what you learn in, in, the, in the lecture hall and in tutorials and online, but more like the life skills, like budgeting your time, uh, maybe not going out to pub night on Thursday, um, and, you know, staying inside and studying. I know we talked about chilling, but you learn to manage life, and you learn to go through ups and downs, failing doing really well and you don't it, it stinks at the time but when you look back you learn a lot about yourself um, I understand when I was in kinesiology first year Monday morning class at 8 a.m. no one went and and it, it's it's just little things like that that you know getting up at 545 to make sure you're there at 8 and when I went to college after I went and it was college that you didn't need anything besides you needed a high school diploma that was it so I went with some people who were straight out of high school, like 17, 18 years old. And you can tell that these guys were just all over the place. Like there were, some of us would stay and, and cut highlights till two in the morning and practice in the studio and read highlights and um, trying to find your voice. And these guys would go out because they had friends who went to Guelph and it was pub night, it was Friday and like, oh, we don't have school until three o'clock in the afternoon. I can go out tonight and be in school by noon. It's fine. And those are the guys who don't have jobs yet. And, uh, it's the ones, and I spoke with my teachers about it too, and, and they wish they could have a cutoff. Like, I wish we could at least have kids with a, a college diploma or a degree. Because it's not because they're more talented, they're just, they have better life experience, and they take things more seriously um, when they get to school. And the ones that do have degrees are the ones with jobs, uh, because they can understand the, the magnitude of what they're doing, while the other kids just kind of, huh. And so, that's, that's why I think university is good. Like, by not showing your report card, but, like, when you put into a crisis situation, you say, oh, I, I remember this. I, I handled this when I was an undergrad. I can, I can study for six hours, no problem. So I can work on a production for seven. It's not a big deal. But yeah, compared to some of those kids who came from high school, they were useless. The one thing a university degree gives you, and there's no, I don't regret anything, all the degrees that I have, and I don't regret being asked to just do the spell and the grammar check at work, uh, it gives you confidence. So I can meet, for me, for my clients, or to rate, you know, I've met Ted Rogers, people of that stature. I can go in and out of conversations, light and heavy and easy, because guess what? I know history. Guess what? I know how to properly speak, because I've done so many presentations, you know, in, in university. I can publicly speak. People get scared of public speaking, you know. I don't at all. I love it. I love meeting new people. I love cold calling. I love, I just love to listen to people. That's what university gave me, was confidence. You know, and that girl's still from the prairies, from the uneducated family, but I have the confidence. I went to Johns Hopkins, you know? It, and, I work, and I worked hard to get there. So it gives you a work ethic, and it gives you a lot of great skills, written and oral communication, and the ability to connect with people. Because my business, like so much of what I'm hearing to hear too today, is relationships. And you don't connect on people with people many times on business. The amount of business I've put through on, you know, personal relationships is insane. You know, my husband always goes, if I had a job like yours where you're laughing on the phone all the time, you know, and I, I take that light, but you know, I'm also, I do like a lot of serious work. These are big deals I'm putting through. A lot of it's personal because guess what? They can trust you. You're sincere, you have integrity, so. Don't, don't look at it as a shortcut by skipping university because you will regret it. I also know so many people who dropped out of university or decided not, you know, take a year or two after high school. And you miss that time frame somehow and you don't ever manage to go back. 
because life happens. You get married or you have kids or things happen. You get a job and you now have to pay the bills. Um, and the difference between university and college, I mean, I'll let maybe somebody else address that more. But I mean, I teach at Seneca College. Uh, and I taught there while I was a university student doing my master's here at York. The quality of education at university is a whole different level than what you get at a college. I'm not saying one's better than the other, it's just different. And you need that university to give you the foundation. So when I look at, you know, to uh, choose my applicants for my uh, film school in the summer, Unless they have a university, they better have a lot of life experience that they bring to the table if they don't have a university degree. And <coughs> I don't, by rule, take high school grads because they haven't learned to live yet, right? So don't for a second think, well, you know what, if I drop out of university now, then I can save so much money and I can get a job and it's not, you will pay for it at the end and you will regret it big time. See, university <laughs> gives you a certain way of thinking, G gives you, um, I think the common phrase is critical thinking skills. Um, that's kind of a new phrase for me, but I, I understand uh, that's very common. And, and what that um, actually teaches you is professional survival skills. Uh, it makes you more adaptable in the workplace. Um, when you go to college and you learn a certain trade, you know how to do that trade. But with um, university and, and the exposure to um, expansive thinking, uh, if I can say that, will allow you to move sideways and laterally uh, if you have to. Uh, and especially in the profession of film and television and broadcast media, um, you have to make those moves. Um, it's very difficult to have a 25-year career doing just one thing in the industry. And I think university gives you the headset that allows you to make those moves. Um, oh, sorry, to make a Yeah. I've I get this question a lot, especially where I am, because we take um, anybody in our space in the sense of you can be university or you can be college or you could be community member. Um, I do have a bias because I have three degrees, but I do think that you can't understate a university degree. The issue is what did you think you were going to get out of the university degree? And if you're not getting it, it's on you. Because if you think it was going to get you a job, you were wrong. And do you want a job? Or do you want a career? Do you want sustainability? Or do you want to just, you know, pass through? So if, if you ask yourself what you want out of university, then you'll find out how to get there. Um, for me, if you don't find the practical things, because I spoke to it when I started, you don't have a lot of internship opportunities. They don't have to give you internship opportunities. Internship opportunities exist outside of the university. So if you want the practical skills, go apply for them. Because what they're giving you is, yes, the word critical skills will be thrown around and you might not even know what that means or what that should mean to your life. Well, what I see, what I observe from individuals from different walks of life in my space is maturity. There's a difference. There's a difference in um, the conversations that somebody has. If we're talking to somebody in our news department and telling them to follow a lead, the conversations just are different. I'm not saying better or worse, they're just different. So <coughs> ask yourself, what do you think this was? and then make it happen, because it's not just on the university. When I was reading Jürgen Habermas, Marshall McLuhan, and Innes, at the time, I didn't know what that connection would be to broadcasting until I came out of school. And I understood the, the makings of media, the journey of media, and now I'm preparing myself for the future of media. And all of those conversations, all of those critical pieces, all of those essays that I wrote are now coming back to be very useful to me. And it definitely changes my conversation. I have different levels of conversation with individuals now because of university. Yeah. 
Oh, well, just that I only have my undergrad and my parents keep saying, get your master's, go to grad school. Um, and it's something that I really struggle with because I don't really want to sit in a room and talk about making TV shows when I could go out and make TV shows. To me, that's much more exciting is to be on set. Um, but I get it. You know, I understand that when you're coming from that background of having all that education, it's absolutely helpful. And you make more money. <laughs> like, it's just the case that people hear as me and they're like, oh, this person, you know, worked at Whole Foods and... You know, you hire them, or this person has their, you know, it just looks better. <clears throat> How important would you say having a mentor or finding the right mentor would be, and uh, what impacts would you say? Sorry, this is really low. <laughs> You're really tall. Does it go that high? Yeah. <laughs> It detaches. We've got, got some pretty bad hands. Um, okay, so yeah, how important would you say having a right mentor and what experience did you guys have with having a really good mentor in your lives? Um, so just speak about that a little bit. Please. Oh, for me, it was everything. It's my lifeline. You know, I had this one here who continues to be my mentor. Um, Can you stand up? Maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's going to be mine. But you know, to you. I want a mentor. <laughs> yeah, listen what, to what? this. Speaking of people, my cousin who worked at the TTC in the economic department, she connected me to her boss who became Premier Harris's press her secretary. So when I met this fellow, I had no idea how to connect. I had no idea how to promote myself. I had no idea of any of the above in the real world. I came from the ivory tower. This guy was my lifeline for the longest time. So, and you know what, the funny thing is when he said, uh, you know, when I finally got my job at CTV and so forth, he said, promise me that you'll do the same. You know, don't give me a gift and all that kind of stuff. Just promise me you'll connect with somebody. And yeah, for me, the transition of, out of coming out of really the ivory tower, you know, when you're locked in 18th century French arguing over a word that Diderot said that impacted the course of art history, Nobody cares about that esoteric thought, you know? Like, I was kind of out of it when I left academia. Um, so yeah, I needed someone to help me switch gears. And that was my lifeline, and I've had two or three ever since. And yeah, I'm indebted to these people. But I also know I work better one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not necessarily a networker. I go to all my you know, community and uh, industry functions, but it was my lifeline. It really helped yeah. me. For me, I've had a series of mentors. It's not See? one person. Yeah. It's been like I do a contract for three months, and I work with someone, and I learn as much as I can from them. And then you move on to the next, you know, freelance job, and you, you're there for a few weeks, a few months, whatever. Um, and you take the and you see what people are doing that you want to, uh, you know, emulate their stuff. And then you see people who are not necessarily, you yeah, know, teachers, doing you, stuff. Yeah, and you go, you oh, want, like I had a boss who just literally all day looked at pictures of pizza like online, and I'm like, we're making a TV show. <laughs> so that was frustrating for me, and it was like, was I'm not going to ever be that. Pizza? No, it wasn't even about pizza, it wasn't even a food show. So like, I think that you kind of learn as much as you can from all your mentors, you know, and good and bad. You, and they learn to like kind of nurture or pull out of you what you don't know. Mm -hmm. It's just like a whole thing I ended up in sales. I didn't grow up thinking sales is my calling. Mm -hmm. Somebody found something, and it was through a mentor of a mentor. That's how it happens, and that's how it happened for me. Yeah, no, it's great to have a mentor. It's, and, and the thing is, you don't go out and announce, I'm looking for a mentor. Yeah. It's not like you know, applying for a position or going on a you know, blind date. It just kind of happens, happenstance. Uh, and I know that when I started my career uh, fresh from Saskatchewan, uh, one of the first two or three people I met was a producer at CBC Radio. And he saw in me that I, to this day, can't see, but he had this extreme faith in me. And he's one who made me um, work towards being, becoming the first Canadian journalist to go into North Korea. And, and so that was huge for the rookie journalist who's never really traveled beyond Saskatchewan. Uh, who really didn't know that much. But he saw something, he says, well, you can do it, right? And he was my mentor for about a decade. Mm -hmm. And I owe my whole career, like, and he's the one who got me certain uh, radio documentary, which then made me move into the television film documentary. So you don't see it at the time, because you're so kind of 
busy living your life, but in hindsight, you, and you can really connect the dots, you know, who was there for you. Yeah, I, th I think it's, um, it's clear that mentors are good, and it's great to find them, and they are important. Um, but sometimes it's difficult to get your hands on one. Uh, if you're in the work environment, someone that you're working for or with that has a lot more experience and certainly qualifies to be your mentor might simply be too busy getting the job done to take you under their wing and walk you through life, you know. So there are a couple of places where you can look, uh, where you can find mentors um, who want to help and are available to help and are experienced uh, and are qualified to help. Uh, one is the Ontario Media Development Corporation, the OMDC. You've heard of that? Yes? Yeah? No? Okay. Um, it's the provincial um, agency that helps um, people in the film and, and television industry. They have a program called the Mentorship Program, where they will assign you someone to work on your project. There's also um, an organization called LIFT. Have you heard of LIFT? Yes? Nobody's here? Okay. Um, this is it's an acronym for the Liaison of Independent Filmmakers of Toronto. And, uh, and that's kind of a network of people who are experienced and also who are new, where you can work side by side with people who are giving their time uh, to help emerging filmmakers like yourselves. So those are a couple of places where you can start to look. Thank you. I think having mentors uh, is, is right. And also, it is really tough to find someone who wants to give you that time. If you're someone like myself who wanted, who, whose goal was to be on air, talking to another on air person to, for, to be your mentor is difficult because they're busy. Their job is always on the line. And you're basically asking them, hey, can you help me get a job so I could take your job eventually? And there's very few on air jobs out there, especially uh, for sports, if, any, if you have, anyone wants to get into sports. Even for hard news, there's only a couple channels. and. It's tough, and so I found that my best mentors were my teachers, because it was kind of their job, and uh, they were honest. That's the that's the one quality you want them to have is honest. You don't want them to to tell you what you want to hear. You want to you want them to make you cry and make you ponder your life, and that's what my teachers did, and they they were brutally honest with me. I call them my my psychiatrist, and my more than anything, they didn't prescribe me medicine, but. A psychologist. They're my psychologist. They made me think a lot, and they're brutally honest with me. And they're the ones that help me the most. And um, yeah, yeah, honesty is best policy in my case. If, if you want to find a quality with a mentor or mentors, make sure they're severely honest with you. Yeah, none of my mentors have ever been from the industry. I come no. from a very competitive industry, and the last thing we do is help another person, you know, call yeah. <laughs> who, would, who would share an idea. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just somebody being honest with you, candid, and maybe helping you in a direction you don't even know about. So. And that's it. I didn't know anything about CHCH. And then my teacher's like, I heard their sports guy just left. You should right. talk to so-and-so. And I did. And I was like, see, where is that? I had to research it. And it's a, it's a big station. It's not as independent, but it's rather popular in the Halton, Niagara, Hamilton region. And I went and I applied for the sports job and they immediately told me, like, we don't have a job for you. And I was like, all right. And then two weeks later, they offered a different position, but it was on air. So I took it. And, but yeah, if it wasn't for someone telling you, like, oh yeah, broadening her, your horizons and telling you things you didn't even know about out there and also about yourself. And then, so yeah, it's true. It's true. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? So I have one more. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what your day to day is like? Because I mean, you, you sound like you have, all of you have some really exciting jobs, but it's, I'm curious and I'm sure we'd like to know what is it like? What's a day in the life? Mark, do you want to start? Okay. Um, <laughs> I have two days in the life to share. Uh, there's the current job that I have in communications here at York, and basically um, you fight the rush hour traffic and you get here as soon as you can. I'm usually here about 8 o'clock in the morning. And um, the first thing you do is, um, is check your email, and what you find there is basically what you're going to be doing for the next four hours. And um, uh, for me, it's finding um, news items relating to York, in particular the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, 
and um, posting that on our website and also sharing it through our social media networks. Um, and then there's various other projects that take place, all kinds of different things, mainly involved with um, uh, covering them and bringing the news of what our professors are doing to the students in the world. So there'll be a, a lecture that we have to go to and film like this lady is doing here. And um, or maybe take some pictures or maybe profile uh, a professor and his work and his research and the classes that he teaches. <laughs> and then bringing that material back and refining it, putting it through the editing process, maybe adding some pictures and B-roll and posting that to YouTube. So that's basically everything you do in, in this kind of job. In the film world, um, it's a little bit the same. Mark, sorry, can you speak into the mic? Oh. Sorry about that. In the film world, it's, um, it's similar, but very different, um, because you're always involved with sales. So you're either selling your idea to do your next project, or you're selling the film that you've just made. So um, you're checking the emails and dealing with the various distributors, broadcasters, and, uh, and other stakeholders that are related to the industry, and in particular, the project you either want to do or have just done. Um, a lot of it is promotion, where you're attending film festivals and having screenings and sending it out to the media and trying to get coverage. Uh, the importance about getting that kind of coverage um, is the favorable ones uh, you include in your uh, sales package that your distributor or sales agent will use to um, either get your project off the ground or sell the one that you've done. So there's no real nine to five when you're doing your own uh, film project that way. It's really around the clock and around the world. Um, you have to be prepared to get up at five in the morning to phone Europe because that's when their day starts. And you have to be prepared to work till 9 p.m. because that's when LA answers the phone. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, Phil, what? do you want to uh, work this way? Uh, uh, well, I kind of touched base on it already, but Unless something crazy happens, like Superstorm Sandy, and it's going to affect your region, and you know exactly what you're going to talk about the next day. Uh, my day is, I get to work. Uh, I live in Toronto, and so I drive to Hamilton. I get there at 1.30 in the morning. And if we don't know anything that's going on, I'll call the cops um, in Hamilton and Niagara and Halton. I'll just ask. We've, we've created a relationship, and they'll just tell me. This, there's a multiple car crash out on the Niagara bound QEW, you should probably go. So when they say you should probably go, it means something bad happens. So, or you check Twitter and they have, we have freelancers who let us know or, or you follow police officers and they let you know or paramedics. And I go and uh, my camera guy doesn't show up until four in the morning. So I get there and I shoot the scene. I take B-roll of the scene. Um, I talk to, as I said, witnesses and police officers and whoever come back to the station, edit it myself. And when my camera gets there, if it's, still a, if it's still a scene or if it's still a big story uh, and affects a lot of people, we'll drive back to wherever it is and we will do live reports every 30 minutes. Hopefully, optimally, you're progressing the story. You, you talk to cops, you're always in tune with the police officers, witnesses. And um, after that, your day's done at 9.30. And then you drive home when there's no one on the road. And... <laughs> Uh, and then you do whatever you can to, I find that from 11 a.m. until 4 p.m. when I go to bed, that whatever I do then will prepare for my next day. So if I eat like crap, or I don't do it, but if I were to go to the bar after, it would really mess me up the next day. So I don't do that. Um, yeah, and then just tire myself out because going to bed at 4 in the afternoon on, in July is tough. Um, especially when you live in a condo downtown. <laughs> so yeah, that, that is it. That, that is it. But then if you do know what you're doing, you research and you go, and that's it. It's a lot of learning on the fly, lots of learning on the fly and getting things really quickly and memorizing names that you don't know any of these people. And you don't want to look like a fool and get someone's name wrong on live television. And it's a lot of that too. So yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The name? Uh, okay, so my day is, Similar to most people, you kind of start off with your emails. Um, my problem is I'm a bit of a workaholic, so my emails come to my phone, the smartphone, and so I'm. Once I'm up, I'm working. 
and uh, emails either uh, are follow up from something you did the day before or they will direct your day and so in in my instance this morning an email directed my day because just before coming over here I had to meet with our board members because they wanted to do my job review today so we did that just before I came here and then when I go back we have um, a special day broadcast tomorrow that I have to finish up some research for so I'm going back to do that so that I can hopefully leave before 8 o'clock tonight so that I can rest because I'm starting my day really really early tomorrow like 4 a.m. so it depends on the day really like uh, depend on the time of year I have budgeting to do that um, that can go on for days um, just because you're trying to squeeze money from the spaces out there and uh, trying to find it and um, and then there are days that are fun and um, because I'm in media there there were there were some challenging days so there were days where I was leaving my house directly going downtown to courtrooms and then coming back and doing my regular day because um, in media sometimes people sue us so you 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 get all kinds of uh, things to deal with so it really depends on the day, sometimes the time of year. Um, if it's budget season, end of month, end of year, those kind of things, um, as far as my job goes. As far as somebody who's um, way more in, uh, into the interesting side of media, like doing a show and so on, whenever I do a show, my day is about prepping for the show, researching for the show, um, listening and re-listening to music, maybe scripting myself so that I don't um, actually make mistakes and stuff like that. So it depends, um, literally, on the day. Thank you. Shane? I was just writing down some of the things I deal with. Um, yeah, to avoid the traffic rush, i got to get in before I uh, leave my house. I live in Richmond Hill, I have to leave the house at seven, ten, no, 10 to 7, so I can get in early. Uh, first part is answering emails. Clients now work 24-7 too, so the days of 9 to 5 are totally gone. And for example, it's one thing to negotiate an order, but it's another thing to put the order through. I have an assistant who's literally chained to his desk who works side by side on all orders because in TV we only have 12 minutes to sell and when it's sold, it's sold. So there's a race with us internally to get the buy done as fast as possible. Like breakfast TV sold out next week, so a buy I got this morning, they can't get breakfast TV. So I have to find a make good. Sorry, Shane, what are you selling? I sell air. Air. I sell air at a very expensive rate. <laughs> you know, I sell everything from breakfast TV city line to The Bachelor. I sell Omni. I sell like, you know, Chinese, uh, I sell Deja Bollywood. I'll sell Sportsnet. I'll sell Bio. I sell air. And I can sell only 12 minutes of it. And I compete against everyone in my team, all 12 of us who sell advertising space uh, in the retail market. And I compete against National. So Procter and Gamble and all those people were all vying for the same 12 minutes. So um, when you book your order, you book, say, 600 spots. I just hope when the order comes back, all 600 are booked because chances are there will be some shows that are sold out where I have to find suitable inventory, and it's all based on rating points. So I'm always looking at how shows deliver in terms of rating <coughs> points. But, you know, yesterday I had to renegotiate a sports snap by. I had to deal with collections because someone wasn't paying their bill. We were airing the wrong 30-second commercial, which is not very good. <laughs> and a client gave us a 30 instead of a 15 second commercial. We work closely with the traffic department, which is just this humongous department of people just doing this all morning and all day. So TV spot placement, ad placement, buying air is a very, very time consuming thing because it's one spot after another. You know, the client didn't like where the commercial aired, so we got to put it in a different commercial break. Oops, we can't get this. You need a, a Telecaster number to air your commercial. Where is the commercial? Phone the production department. Where is it? When is it coming? When can we expect it? Oh, we need this one, um, you know, um, voiced over in Cantonese or Italian. So a lot of my job is just troubleshooting. It's one thing to get the order and do that. It's another thing to maintain it. The paperwork and TV is just outrageous. So there's that, and then you're looking for new business because I have a budget to make every single year. And a lot of it is renewals, but and 
growing the business, but all of it is too, looking for new, new business because I have a 30% churn rate. So we're on a treadmill. We have busier times than other times like come renewal time. I will work easily 12 hours a day. That's just the nature of the beast. And then there'll be times like in July, I'm like, you know. So and we sell two, three months in advance too. So I, you know, I'm already buying inventory for June, July, and August. Sure sounds pretty interesting. Yeah. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so right now I'm working on Linger by this. So we send crews around the world to see fantasy homes. Um, so a lot of the day I'm researching like, you know, Spain or um, my crew just got back from Peru and Ecuador. Um, one of our crews was in Nicaragua and they got to the border and they couldn't get our equipment out of the airport. And they were just stranded. So a lot of my job is putting out fires and kind of making it work and being like, where can we rent cameras in Nicaragua for a few days? So it's like random stuff like that. Um, but it's always like, it's never boring. That's why I love my job. Um, and I write the scripts and they get rewritten so many times. Like I can spend so long on a script and think, oh my God, it's perfect. And then it goes to my boss who changes it. It goes to the network, she changes it. It goes to a wordsmith and then it goes to our director and then it gets shot. So. Like, I never really know what's going to make it to the show. Sometimes I watch and I'm like, oh my god, I wrote that little sentence. And it's so exciting. <laughs> um, and then another thing that I do is we have a website called um, Lights Camera Casting, and um, people can um, submit ideas for a TV show. So if someone's like, like this morning I got an email, they're, quad they're identical um, quadruplets in uh, Alberta and they think that they should have a TV show. So basically they submitted and, and we're putting together a, I don't know if it's gonna work, but um, so we put together sizzle reels and then we submit them to the networks, which is kind of cool that I get to do a bit of development. So if you have an idea for a TV show, you can find it. so many ideas. I like it more. Everybody thinks their job should be a TV show. And sometimes people are right. Sometimes they are. Anyway. Great, thank you. Sunny? <laughs> um, well, I've been spending a lot of time at the bank. <laughs> <laughs> Begging, borrowing, short of stealing money. Um, being an independent producer, independent filmmaker, what that means is being your own boss. What that means, you have to find the money yourself to pay the rent and put food on the table. So be careful what you wish for. Uh, Sunny, can I, you speak in the mic? Sir? Yeah. And I'm also, I may be the uh, CEO and president of my company, but I'm also the janitor, right? So it does certainly have its perks, and I wouldn't trade it. Right? I love what I do. I love making films. I love telling stories, and I love the travels that are involved. But there's the reality, the business side. So, and I multitask, right? Because film business is extremely detail-oriented and more things will go wrong than right. So you're troubleshooting half the time and the other half the time you're delegating to your crew. So I sleep with my iPhone. I check my emails throughout the night. And in the morning, you know, I'm trying to kind of, as I get dressed, think, okay, what should I do first, which is more urgent? And it just goes through, right? So I have a 10-year-old daughter. She's very much part of the production in that she grew up with this. We work from home. My husband and I do this for a li living, full time. So my day is all about either banging my head against the wall because I can't get money, banging my head against the wall because my writing is not going well, or I can't get a meeting with a broadcaster that I really need to get a meeting with. So it's from A to Z. And an average time to make a film is about a year. And the, you know, and I'm, I'm very different from, because I do documentaries, it's very different reality genre. And so it's a smaller budget, smaller production team. But, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I think at this time, um, we'll break for networking. But before we do, I think we got some really excellent um, stories, nuggets of advice, inspirational thoughts. And I've written some down as we went along that occurred to me and that stuck out for me. Um, so first and foremost, chill. It, things will I work like out. Yes, so I mean, was it? yes. <laughs> Rel relax. Things will, will work out. Um, 
although university degree is important, in this industry it seems that grades aren't the be all end all. It's really about experience. It's really about putting yourself out there, being open to opportunities. Um, internship, I heard internship a lot, experience. Uh, paid or unpaid, it seemed like most of you or many of you did a lot of unpaid opportunities. And I know at the Career Center students are always coming in and we struggle with this all the time, you know, to, to want to be paid, to have to be paid. Um, but it sounds like in this industry you might have to open yourself to the reality of doing a volunteer work um, to make those connections with people in the industry who will open other doors for you. So make connections, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a larger network by participating in conferences, groups, unions, the Ontario Media Corporation, right? Did I say that? The Ontario Media? Development, Development Corporation. Development Corporation. Lift. Um, Academy Connect, Kingston. find someone who might uh, help you ask those questions. You know, it'd be great. Not everyone's gonna get a mentor, but as you're going along, try to learn from the people around you. Um, be adaptable. And I heard this many times, love what you do, because you have to really be able to, to do it for free, um, especially in the beginning. And then come to the Career Center. I definitely heard that a few times. <laughs> <laughs> it changed everything. Yeah. It changed everything. We do have you career counselors the there. <laughs> like Put me Phillip, on. Uh, Philip said, we do have career counselors who can meet with you and you know whether you're just starting uh, and don't know how to take the next step or whether you totally know where you want to go and just need someone to bounce ideas off of, we do have career counselors who you can meet with as well as job search advisors. So you can talk to me more about that. So at this point I just want to uh, say so, so, so thank you so much to all of these uh, panelists who are really excellent and said uh, some really inspirational things and who were really very interesting. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day.